for our next panelist, Neil Levine. <laughs> Some difficult questions. Sure, he's fully prepared to answer. Uh, teeing up is one way to put it. <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Margaret. And uh, it's uh, just a pleasure to be on this panel. And uh, uh, I'm adjusting my remarks because I think we've just heard uh, a really interesting, uh, aside from the report, a real um, uh, in-person reflection on what it's like to sit uh, uh, from the, the partner government side. And I think, you know, the headline uh, for the report is um, that uh, the record of the donors in these six countries is uh, quite modest in, in some. And the minister's remark uh, tells us two things, I think. Once we have, one is that we have much to be modest about. Uh, we have uh, also, uh, another way to say that is uh, we have uh, almost limited, limitless potential to improve on our performance. Um, the, uh, but I think the, the, the last point that she made, uh, and Rich, we had some of this discussion about uh, the uh, temptation to add additional principles. And what struck me in the minister's remark is that we should all be reminded that uh, at the end of the day, the development work that we're in is, is fundamentally a human enterprise, and that we need to seek out that human connection if we're really going to be uh, effective in, at, at whatever level you're working at. So uh, uh, just as a, kind of an immediate off-the-cuff reaction to uh, what I thought was not only uh, right on point, but uh, delivered in a refreshingly candid uh, way. So thank you. Um, let me say a, a few things about um, uh, our office in USAID and why uh, we've been asked to be here today. And then I want to make a few comments as the sort of designated donor in terms of how the report is received on our end uh, and uh, some of the uh, uh, focus on some of the highlights of our discussions over the past few days. Um, and then finally indicate, uh, as Richard did, a, a sort of a way forward in, in general terms. And then I look forward to your questions. And I, I will be brief in respect to uh, a, a very full panel. Uh, I'm also uh, delighted to be here with uh, a good friend and uh, sometime colleague, uh, Joanna Mendelson, and uh, a new friend and colleague, uh, Fatima Sumar. Um, uh, the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation is, is in essence, the chief interlocutor with our colleagues at the OEC DAC and the Development Assistance uh, Committee. We have been, uh, we have a long history both with the INCAF and with its predecessor organizations and did some of the first work uh, coming out of AID on fragile states and we found uh, willing collaborators and really uh, some big brains to really help us through uh, some of the fundamental issues uh, on the analytical side and formulating what came to be our uh, fragile states uh, strategy in AID in the early uh, part of this decade and the founding of our office in 2002, the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation. Uh, briefly, what do we do? Uh, five things. Uh, technical leadership is a fancy way of saying uh, research and policy development. We are, our job is really to find the cutting edge of conflict issues in advance of them showing up on our doorstep in the field. Uh, right now, uh, recently we've uh, uh, released toolkits that are uh, for kind of the immediate audience is the aid field manager or field office, but also we believe builds the knowledge of the field in general. And we canvas widely in academia, the practitioner community, uh, uh, and uh, deliver these toolkits. The last two, one was the uh, uh, relationship between assistance and peace processes, another was on programming in religious environments. Uh, but the th types of topics we're looking at now are the role of diaspora in conflict, both positive and negative, uh, the role of urbanization and conflict, uh, and uh, the topic of climate change and uh, its implications. Uh, to give you a sense of that. The second area is technical uh, assistance. That's the support we give to field missions and other uh, units of the federal government uh, on uh, program design, evaluation, assessment, uh, reviewing programs for some of the principles that we've heard from under the report, do no harm, uh, conflict sensitivity, sensitivity to the uh, political and economic environment that we're working in. 
The third area is interagency liaison. As you know, uh, we are always in these environments working in a 3D atmosphere. Uh, so uh, uh, engagements with the State Department, the Regional Bureaus of the State Department, the Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization, the Office of the Coordinator for Counterterrorism, the Combatant Commands of the Military, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and others. I would say, uh, most of our interagency liaison obviously involves the State Department to a lesser degree the other uh, federal agencies outside the, the 3Ds. Fourth area is training uh, and cadre development. We uh, train both overseas and uh, in Washington. That training right now is targeted uh, principally to AID staff, but also other interagency staff. But each time we go out, uh, there is a call, you know, this is great for us, but we really need to bring in both the partner countries and to the partner uh, uh, implementing communities. And we've done that sort of on a pilot basis, more ad hoc. Our next iteration of, of training design really wants to expand the audience and our ability to reach out and exchange with the partner and implementing community uh, what their experience is and to refine our products at the same time. Uh, the last area is public outreach, and uh, here we are today. So, uh, Just to give you a sense, uh, we are very small in terms of budget. Our request of, uh, uh, we request about $9 million in core funding. Uh, we will actually operate with much less than that this year, about $3.5 million. Uh, we also uh, manage a congressional uh, directive, uh, which we are quite happy to do, uh, of $26 million in people-to-people -people reconciliation programs. It's a small uh, program. It's been around for about um, six years now. Uh, small grants of between half a million and a million dollars to bring two sides of conflict uh, together for uh, reconciliation, building of, of trust, and uh, work on cooperatively in development areas. We're about 15 people right now in terms of our staff. Um, in terms of this morning's panel, um, I wanted to uh, sort of cover three areas. Uh, describe the reception the report received at our meeting the last two days the INCAF has met for the first time uh, as uh, USAID as the host. Uh, how that was received and why. Uh, discuss some of the main uh, issues that the report uh, brought up and then offer some thoughts about the way forward. Um, first, why was the uh, report, uh, or how was it received and why? It was received very well uh, because it was viewed as extremely relevant um, to the work we're doing. It was uh, timely. The choice of the countries uh, uh, sort of guaranteed that it would get our attention. Uh, it was authoritative. The methodology, a combination of qualitative and qualitative uh, approaches, uh, really made some judgment as to donor performance, and Richard has reviewed those. Uh, where we were doing good, where we were doing poorly. That tends, any kind of report card tends to get people's attention. Um, it was also uh, based on work that had gone before, and the establishment of these 10 donor principles gave us sort of a, uh, a target, and now we have a baseline of uh, how we're doing, and the fact that this is going to continue is, I think, evidence of some of the better work done. Uh, in terms of evaluative performance. Uh, finally, it had 17 recommendations that you have before you. Uh, and while the donors may not um, agree or embrace all of them equally, I, I think it really does uh, represent a, a genuine attempt to measure and distill the lessons uh, that we have in the field and, and always remembering that these are some of the most difficult working environments uh, that we face in the development area. Uh, so in terms of, uh, I think, somewhat unprecedented uh, an evaluative agenda in fragile states. Uh, to give you a feel uh, for the reactions, I think uh, uh, going around the room and, and uh, uh, responding to the report, each donor sort of picked out uh, their favorites and ones that they thought uh, really spoke to uh, the needs or where we needed to do better. And I just wanted to give you uh, three or four of my own personal favorites and sort of my, what I took away. I think at the very top, and I said this as Richard will recall, is that to recognize that uh, state building is fundamentally a, a political process. And in terms of where we are on, on that, I think that you'll see in the annex of, uh, of the report, uh, it, it really can't be any clearer what needs to be done. Um, the, 
appreciation of the domestic environment, uh, the state, the, the uh, state of state society relations, of where the uh, this is. Are, are most international actors' engagement based on sound political and social analysis, taking into account the situation in terms of national capacity, state society relations, and societal divisions? Reading across for the report of each country, not consistently. Afghanistan, CAR, not consistently. DRC, not consistently. Haiti, not consistently. Uh, Timor Less says yes overall, but more analysis needed rural urban divide. I would say that that's probably not consistently enough uh, there. That to me suggests that at a fairly fundamental level is that we need uh, uh, a better appreciation uh, of that state building will work when it builds on that domestic process, that we must be paying more attention to the governance issues that drive some of these dynamics that we need to pay attention to the relationship between state and society in each of these countries, and that we need to involve stakeholders uh, at the national and local level. Uh, a second uh, recommendation coming out of the report was to invest in uh, joint analysis of donors. And I think this has to do with uh, what the minister referred to as sort of if 46 donors all have their individual take on a problem, that's just too much for any uh, partner to kind of embrace and be effective on. And so this is something hits close to home in that the office that I uh, head is uh, the home of where a lot of the conflict analysis uh, methodology is developed. We're often asked to participate. And we are taking these, uh, uh, this recommendation on board. We have in the past joined up analysis uh, uh, in places like Kenya. We hope to do so in other countries. Uh, uh, very shortly, but it's done right now in an ad hoc basis. This is really a way to arm ourselves and say we really need to do better and get together when we can. Uh, the other area, two more areas, uh, the need for deeper alignment and the more use of host country systems. And uh, this is a good place for some dialogue given the composition of the panel. Uh, this issue of capacity and accountability. Um, the I think if you think about uh, our relationship with the Congress and with the American people, uh, the issue is we want you to be smart, we want you to be accountable, and we want you to be uh, timely. And I think what we have done in the systems we have built, we have, uh, from the American perspective, really weighted our system to one of accountability. Uh, and uh, on the smart one, we, I think at AID, tried ourselves on trying to be smart mixed uh, record, some because it is uncertain. Uh, enterprise, it is more art than science. We're learning all the, all the time, but we strive to make sure that we're smart. And what that has come at is at the uh, cost of uh, rapid delivery and flexibility. And we now face ourselves a system, especially in the context of uh, conflict environments, that uh, our delivery mechanisms uh, don't respond to the reality we face. And that is a much bigger topic than we have this morning. Uh, but it is that tension between accountability and, uh, and uh, rapid delivery and the embrace, I think, more wholeheartedly of the Paris Declaration uh, until there's some understanding about where we can meet up with these countries to provide accountability and uh, uh, responsiveness and still uh, report uh, solidly to the Congress that these funds are not uh, misused or uh, uh, going lost. Um, and then finally, uh, the last point, always the attraction, if any of you have ever received a report card, your, your eyes go directly to the lowest grades uh, and the place where we were weak, these avoiding pockets of exclusion. And again, from an analytical agenda to identify what those pockets are and then uh, in terms of program design, how do we get at them? And not only from the assistance, but what is the dialogue in terms of security, in terms of diplomacy to uh, make sure that we uh, do not uh, have pockets of exclusion. The way forward, uh, I think, uh, number one, a lot of discussion about how do we disseminate the findings of this report and make people aware of the process, uh, both of the monitoring and the dialogue on international uh, uh, peace building with the partner countries. This uh, gathering today is really step one. I want to thank the sponsors and uh, the good work at OECD for uh, allowing us to get this to a, a broad audience. And thank you. I should say, for uh, being here as part of that. Um, 
the, uh, again, 60 of my counterparts and donor agencies across the DAC participated in this, so, uh, and trying to figure out what our follow-on activities should be. Uh, while this isn't all together nailed down, I can say with fairly uh, uh, high confidence, we have a hearty con consensus to continue the monitoring process, uh, to continue to consult even more with our partner countries, uh, really using the, uh, the international dialogue on peace building and state building, of which uh, East Timor is a part and other countries. Um, and you will be hosting the next meeting in Dili. Uh, and then to focus on particular attention on developing the donor guidance that comes out of this report for, uh, for state building and that we uh, use these recommendations and get them out to our field partners. Um, this dissemination uh, uh, message is, is maybe the most important at all. What we talk about is this 3D environment and what we're now calling other policy communities. I can't say, I can't tell you how important the work of the DAC is in this regard when there is an international donor consensus in terms of development practice, that when we go and talk to our colleagues at the State Department or uh, with the Department of Defense to say, there's a craft here, there's a way of doing this r the right way and that all international donors have signed up for, to a set of principles. Uh, this avoids uh, a violation of one of the, the central principles, which is do no harm. Uh, another principle is, is don't be stupid. I, I think the issue is that this is a craft. It isn't for everybody. Uh, it can't be done without a great uh, amount of thought and sensitivity and analysis, which is uh, our, our business. Uh, and the work of the DAC in formalizing that, in uh, getting consensus on that, in monitoring that craft, and then reporting back to other policy communities is just simply vital at this time and uh, where we are as a community. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. That was a very good response. <laughs> Next is Johanna Mendelson Foreman. Thank you, uh, Margaret. and. Uh, Thank you, Richard, for doing this. Thank you, Minister Pierce, for your candor, and Neil and uh, Fatima. Uh, I guess I'm the, uh, like, like Richard, have been around this uh, development community a long time, both as a donor through USAID and the World Bank and a donor through a private philanthropy at the UN Foundation. So I've, I've seen a lot and been a lot, around a lot, and I think the memorialization of these principles that come forth uh, from the DAC are very important because they confirm a lot of what many of us have seen over the year as being needed to be put down on paper. And as Neil mentioned, that there is a consensus on this as a way to go forward, at least it avoids at least two hours of every meeting trying to get to some kind of yes before you start to do it. So I think just for efficiency, this is an extremely important contribution. Um, when I was reading through these, and I was asked to speak specifically about Haiti, but I think I'd like to address first the uh, principles and how they might apply. Um, one of the things that it reminded me, me of was uh, perhaps the movie Love Story, which dates my generation of love is never meaning never is meaning never having to say you're sorry. And I think this is what these principles remind me of: that donors have finally come together and said, you know, maybe, you know, we should have to never say we're sorry, but. You know, we didn't understand the context, and we really don't want to do much harm. And intervention was not long enough in these countries to really make a sustainable situation. And we're really sorry that we really didn't get the analysis right. But you know, so what? You'll go back to conflict because according to Paul Collier, half of these countries that were on the list go back into conflict. So we have a chance to do it over again. And I guess um, for me, having looked at these principles and then thinking about the case of Haiti, a lot of these principles and a lot of the errors, in fact, reflect some of the lack of application of learning over the years that perhaps may not be repeated again as we have yet another chance at something that uh, is obviously one of the greatest tragedies we've seen, uh, certainly the worst tragedy in the Western Hemisphere as far as a uh, natural disaster is concerned, bigger than the tsunami in many respects, because whereas the tsunami covered many countries in South Asia, this affected one country. So in terms of magnitude, um, we are even seeing more difficult times ahead. 
But I, I did want to go back over some of the uh, ratings that came out of this report because, to me, the principle of taking context as a starting point, which the minister so you know, artfully articulated, is something very important. My sense is, in the case of Haiti, and I'll refer to that, context really didn't matter. We had some bad situations, and Haiti was not um, a conflict country. It was, in fact, a state near failure, but it had an internal low-level civil war, as we would talk about it, in that it was based on exclusion of people, but it wasn't a, an open, violent conflict. It was an urban, I would say, insurgency in many ways, where you had people fighting one another because of the nature of the exclusion and the uh, separation. So to say that context is the first principle and has to be uh, taken into account is, to me, an obvious and often overlooked by donors when they work in countries um, such as Haiti, which have tremendous problems. Uh, for example, it shares an island with the Dominican Republic. Yet, I, when I met with people, even when I was with the UN there, people from the Dominican Republic who share the island from the UN agencies hardly ever talk to the people on the other side of the island. Yet, one of its <laughs> primary problems was an environmental de de degradation which would affect both sides. So context matters. Uh, the second point about do no harm uh, is an interesting point. How much more harm can you do in a country where 57 percent of the population, you know, lives on two dollars a day or less? Uh, so that doing nothing often was easier than doing something because of the scale and scope of the problem. Um, state building is also an important area because USAID, I think, does two things extraordinarily well. It works in communities and it understands the community context and it also understands institutional development. But unfortunately, over the years, the two were not treated together. So that institutions were developed in this capital, which often were not spread out to the majority of population in Haiti, and that the local institutions were left for fending for themselves, so that you didn't have the integration of two important state building components. What happens at the local level where the majority of people live versus what happens at a national capital and how you spread the uh, ability or the capacity of the state beyond uh, one central city, which is the Republic of Port-au-Prince, which is now in rubble. Another thing that I think is fascinating, and Neil will you know, know this, and I don't know if Dick, you remember it, but security, the word security, you could not mention the S word in the early 90s in a meeting of donors, if they were aid donors, because security was a verboten topic. And yet we now know from post-conflict reconstruction that security is the condition precedent to any type of development. And of course, the minister articulated that too in her crisis in 2006. And yet there was no real sense of how to integrate the needs of a security sector with the broader sustainability of a development program. I think that's now ingrained and I think that's a success story. And certainly, uh, as you mentioned in the report mentioned, security is very important. In the context of Haiti, getting back to that, one of the areas that the report rated highly favorably was the training or the retraining of the police. I think we finally got it right. It's, I think, our third try. It's the eighth UN intervention. But we're getting to the point where actually one of the most dramatic moments was when after the earthquake, within two days, Haitian National Police, who couldn't even find their uniforms because they were lost in the rubble, came out on the street to support Minusta troops in actually directing traffic, directing aid workers, and there was a sense of, for the first time that I could witness, a professionalism that had been ingrained by training. Now, one of the things that security and the hit dirty little secret about security is often when the donor community believes things are, quote, secure, we go home. Now, we can't go home and that security is something that has to become cultural. And actually, before the earthquake, the exit date for the UN in Haiti was 2011, you know, another year, because the sense was that the Haitian National Police would have been fully trained to the capacity that was acceptable, uh, which is a greater expectation than we have for security, but was going to work. Now, the UN, MINUSTA, the collective, is talking about at least a 10-year 
presence. This may be the best thing that ever happened in that when you have security on the ground, it gives some political space to the governing class to be able to at least have uh, an opportunity to build their institutions, to be able to make things happen, to protect people so they can develop their markets, renew agriculture, etc. So that may be another hidden advantage of this terrible tragedy, that the UN will stay. Um, many, many years ago, I mean, not many, but in the early 90s, uh, we could not talk about donor presence in a country for more than 10 years. In fact, my old friend Nikki Ball used to say that if she wrote 20 years in a report, the editors would cross it out and say 10 years. I noticed in one of the principles about staying power is that we're now not ashamed to say that 10 years is a minimum number of years that is needed in order to be able to see some kind of stability and security established and that in the case of Haiti we will probably see it for a generation probably not at the same level for the next decade but certainly if we really want to get it right uh, things have to happen. Now I'm not going to leave the uh, nationals off the hook on this because Haiti and I've worked there for many, many years is a difficult environment both because the context is difficult from a geophysical uh, perspective. It has 98% uh, deforestation, overpopulation, one central city and no other places to go. But it also has a very difficult political class, a large wedge that does not really believe in the kind of donor cooperation that we're used to. It's very hard to get decisions made. It's not easy to work in this context. One of the interesting outcomes of such a tragedy is that there, is, there was first a growing consensus out of a first tragedy, the floods of 2008, that things had to be better and things had to be rebuilt. And there was including the elites, whom we used to call the morally reprehensible elites, had actually recognized that the global community was watching what was happening, but there was also a trading and an economic advantage to being a team player. So one thing that's happened, which is very interesting, is the economic context in Haiti has changed. And it was very well documented when Paul Collier went in and did a report saying, look, this place is not as bad as you think, donors. You're close to the U.S., you have a good market, you've got a textile peace industry which once was flourishing in the uh, early 80s, you can rebuild that, and then we'll work on some of the needs of energy and deforestation and start working on that. That report in itself was an important sign that accredited economists, people who know about bail states, were saying, hey guys, this is not what you think. We need to work on it. Uh, let's take that as the starting point and think that these principles can actually be used and should be <clears throat> used in the context of the negotiations that are going on now for the donor meeting. The donor meeting affords a very wide berth for both the Haitian nationals and neighboring governments, the Dominican Republic as well, to begin to say how do we work <coughs> with donors because there are large numbers of them. I heard a great statistic the other morning that half of American households had contributed money to the Haiti, Haiti in some form, either through text messaging. So the generosity of the world is there. Now we need to be able to figure out transparency and accountability of the funds, listening to Haitians about how they want to decentralize their country because they know that it has to be centralized, figuring out a way to solve their energy problems, and looking at the island as a part of the broader American community in the security context and understanding that if it fails, its neighbors fail, and that we have a communal problem. These principles can go a very long way to begin to educate the donors as they sit down in New York next month, and also the Haitians who have to be able to contribute to this in many ways as a form and a platform to move. So I congratulate the DAC and I congratulate all of you, and perhaps Minister Furies, you can come to the donor meeting in March and help uh, the government of Haiti to, uh, to understand that they're not the only ones who complain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna. Fatima. Can you turn the microphone on, please? Is this better? Okay. I apologize. We're having a little problem with the mics. Mine keeps going off spontaneously. So if, if you can't hear any of us, um, there, it went off again. or Senator Kerry, but I wanted to give a quick perspective here of some of my thoughts on what the administration is doing differently on development in Afghanistan, building on some of the principles that came out of this report today. Um, 
quickly, I, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the context in Afghanistan, but I, I assume we have a lot of experts here in the room. So I just wanted to quickly summarize what the major challenges have been for, the, for eight years and what's different now under the Obama administration, what they're doing well and where I think we still have a lot, long ways to go. In, you know, the five key things that I, in my mind, have been the biggest development challenges for donors, weak state institutions, limited capacity and reach, but still persistent weak leadership coming from President Karzai. And recent moves that we've seen with the election reform um, in, in recent days and even steps since the inauguration have kind of reinforced that for many people, that there's still a lot of weak leadership coming from the presidency. There's been a reluctance for eight years now for donors to fund the government directly. Only 80 percent of donor funding still goes outside of state institutions, and that's a huge problem when we're sitting here in 2010 and thinking about that. There's been a consistent misalignment of donors to local priorities. And while a lot of people tout the very successful rollout of the Afghan National Development Strategy, which was a huge milestone for Afghanistan, it is a massive roadmap with um, very little prioritization of the priorities. And so it's very hard for donors to map that to what Afghans really want, especially outside of a national context when you get at the provincial and district levels. There's still very limited donor coordination. Um, this is a role that UNAMA has taken on as one of its main priorities. I do think they're making some headways, but it's still a huge problem in terms of where we're going. And finally, and this is what Joanna was mentioning, the S word, the impact of ongoing military operations and the civilian mili military coordination challenges. We are doing development and, con and reconstruction in an ongoing war zone in some cases, and the challenges of that are frankly enormous, and I think unprecedented in some ways outside of the Iraq context. So I just wanted to talk briefly about what I think have been the main shifts of the Obama administration approach coming from the Bush administration. And this is something that I know Ambassador Holbrook and his team have been working really hard on. And I want to give them a lot of credit um, for really thinking differently about how we can do development in Afghanistan. Because it's the first time, frankly, in eight years of conflict that we're thinking in a very fundamental, holistic way. The first major shift is that there, we are relying less on private contractors and really focusing on what it means to build capacity of Afghan institutions, both in Kabul but also at the provincial and district levels. And that's a really important shift. The focus at the support on the national line ministries in, of, of Afghanistan is a major shift as well. Um, when we were there in the fall, they announced, the U.S. government announced how we were going to start funding $235 million directly to the Ministry of Public Health, for instance, a direct line ministry where we know we have leadership coming from that ministry and where we can have a partnership going forward. That was a really important signal in terms of, what, uh, in terms of how we're spending our money. Um, th there's increasingly that we're seeing much better civilian military cooperation coordination. And what's interesting is it's coming both from Embassy Kabul mm -hmm. under Ambassador Eikenberry's mm -hmm. leadership, but also from General McChrystal. He has made this a priority. And when you see the military side stepping up and saying that this is important and we want to be able to do development differently and integrate it, that's a really <coughs> important signal because, frankly, it can't all just come from the development and donor community. A lot of this has got to come from our military partners as well in the field. So that leadership from General McChrystal and our allies has been very important as well. And finally, the civilian surge. Um, the statistic that the State Department touts um, is that they're tri they've they will be tripling by early this year the number of civilians in the field to about 974 with a planned increase of 20 to 30 percent more civilians in the field by the end of this year. So these are major shifts in strategy in terms of if you all remember where we were a year ago. The positives of this, um, I really do want to credit, again, the team for a fundamental rethink. I do think there's a real emphasis now on a civilian strategy and what that means. That's been missing for a long time. There's a fundamental rethink in terms of resources, and we in Congress have been very involved in that process. Um, you know, the statistic that everyone likes to tout is that since 2000, fiscal year 2002, the, um, the United States has spent $51 billion on reconstruction, which sounds like a huge amount. If you tease out the, that money, about 52.4 percent of those costs were in security costs, mostly building up the Afghan National Security Forces. ESF money, which is what the money that USAID gets, has only been about 19 percent. But that 19 percent is when you include 2009 and 2010 funding. If you look back at 2002 numbers, which I was digging up last night because I was curious, it's fascinating because the bar doesn't even get above the, it's so hard, it's so little above the zero, you can't even figure out what it is, but it's about a couple hundred million dollars is where we started in 2002 in terms of um, reconstruction going towards development. So we've come a long way when you think about the 2010 request 
and funds were about $2 billion. So there, there's a huge shift on actually funding a civilian strategy, not just talking about a civilian strategy. Um, Ambassador Holbrook's team has come up with a milestone that we will, uh, we hope that they meet because we're going to hold them to this because it's a really important one, which is that by the end of 2010, 40 percent of U.S. government assistance will be directed directly through Afghan institutions, whether those are local NGOs or the Afghan government directly. Considering that the U.S. is the largest donor by far in Afghanistan, that's a really important shift in terms of building up basic capacity of the Afghan government and Afghan institutions. They're going to be decreasing overhead and related costs for programs. A um, lot of concern on that whole Beltway Bandit approach, which has been documented well over the last few years. Lots of more U.S. aid personnel actually going out into the field to do oversight of contracts, which has been very missing because of the fact that we basically haven't funded U.S. aid in terms of personnel, basic issues like that. Um, and finally, we're starting to see, and I, um, I, I hope this is a shift that the State Department takes on a, a lot more robustly, but we're starting to see new flexible funding authorities for civilians. So for years we had SERP, which is what the military had, so they could do quick impact projects and others, but civilians were very constrained in terms of having their own kind of resources. Well, we're finally starting to see that with programs like the Performance-Based Governors Fund. But I want to emphasize that I still think we have a long ways to go. And, um, one of the problems that I see is that more money is not going to solve the problems. And, we, and in some ways, it's going to exacerbate the issues. And we need to be really, really careful and thoughtful about this. I think we need to be very honest upfront about what our capacity and limitations are. We cannot solve all, a lot of these problems. And I think we need to be a lot more honest about areas where we know we have the capacity and resources to make a difference and where we're frankly just going to make things worse, um, especially in a lot of localized contexts. One of the things that frustrates me is I think, you know, one of the issues that um, people don't talk about as much, but I think are just so core to this when you talk about understanding the cultural local context is religion. You know, we are terrified to talk about religion and we're terrified within the government context to talk about Islam. Well, frankly, you're not going to do local development well if you cannot integrate local religious and cultural practices in a lot of these ways. And I know in the tons of briefings we do every single day on the Hill about talking to the administration about how it's going to do messaging, strategic communications, local development work, no one will talk about religion. And every time I push them, they say, oh, we can't do that, and everyone gets really scared. Well, you know what? We're going to have to think differently about when we talk about context, how much religion matters. And I think there's a long ways to go about rethinking that point for all for all of us in a lot of contexts, but especially within the Afghanistan case. Um, another thing coming out of, actually, I was thinking about this, um, w out of this report, is you talk a lot about state building. Well, um, I'm not a development expert, and um, so I'm a little intimidated being in a room full of development experts. But, you know, we talk a lot about state building, but if you, t if you hear all the speeches by Secretary Clinton, President Obama, Ambassador Holbrook, and yes, from the Hill as well, from uh, you know, um, senators and representatives alike, Everyone on the Democratic side will say that we are not doing nation building in Afghanistan. Well, I don't know what this is when you look at the program. And I keep asking in my questions, what's the definition of state building and nation building? And then map that with what the United States is actually doing. Because I think there's a disconnect. I think there's a political disconnect because um, there are many politically here who are terrified to say that we're doing nation building and getting involved in that and want to say, you know, that's not us. We're not there to do that. We're there to kind of go in, build Afghan capacity, and get out. Well, I'd be fascinated to know what a definition of state building and nation building is in this context, and some really good thinking on how we can get the American political community to be much more comfortable with that. Because once you start owning that and taking responsibility for it, I think you start massaging some of those gaps that you see in the political context, which is really important. Um, and finally, my last point is I think, you know, one of the shifts I think we've seen in this administration in the Afghanistan and Pakistan context, which may be the way this administration is going, is that you see a, a lot of development being driven by the State Department. You see this in every context from Ambassador Holbrook's team. You see this in the field um, where you have in Afghanistan five ambassadors in the front office of the embassy that are one of them in charge of um, the development process in partnership with USAID. You're seeing this increasingly in the Pakistan context. I'll tell you, I used to work at the State Department, and um, I do have a fear that as we keep outsourcing development to the State Department, if that's the direction the administration is comfortable going in, that means we really need an infusion of top development experts in the State Department to make sure 
that foreign policy priorities aren't taking over the development context because you do see this um, practically from where I sit anyway where these decisions are being made to marry foreign policy national security goals and there's always that there's always a fear then that you are going to shortchange practical long-term development needs in that process. So I, I do think we need to be a little bit more honest about the direction of where our policies are coming from. And if that will be the direction, then to think very thoughtfully about how we do that in the best way so that, you know, five years from now the State Department also isn't taking the slack for if, if, if um, some of those goals aren't reached at the same time. So thank you very much and I look forward to Thank you so much. To all.